We'll wait for 10 seconds. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Weekend Chat with Researchers, Part 3 by Bugbeer. We are a part of uh, National Center for Biological Sciences, CIFR Bangalore. And uh, these live stream sessions are a part of our outreach initiative. We believe anybody sitting at home can understand research, science, science and research uh, without being part of, uh, without being part of it. And with us, uh, before before we start, I would request you all to use our uh, live chat option to ask further questions related to the session. And without further ado, I will introduce ourselves, myself Nitish, and with me, Mohawk and Ashwin will be your host for today. So uh, Ashwin, like our title uh, of this session is like fantastic uh, bacteria and where to find them. like. I, I cannot imagine like fantastic word going with the bacteria itself. So are bacteria really fantastic? Ah, uh, sorry, I just, there's a small issue with my Zoom. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, I would uh, argue that they are probably the most uh, fantastic uh, beings on, on earth. Um, sorry, Sunil, who would argue that fungi are the most <laughs> fantastic beings on earth, but well, they, they're more or less on, on, on par. And uh, the bacteria and uh, are um, probably that the kingdom of life, which uh, you would see pretty much everywhere um, on, on earth, um, um, uh, hot springs, um, Antarctica, whatever that you're looking at, you, you, you would find um, uh, bacteria and there would be no life uh, uh, without uh, bacteria. It is um, uh, most likely bacteria that produced first oxygen on um, earth and that made all other forms of life uh, possible. So yeah, they're, they are to be the most important and the most fascinating forms of life on earth. Right, and then, like you rightly said, they are everywhere. You don't even have to go to these remote places. You can find them in your kitchen, in your garden, and and so on. And I think these are some of the things that we are going to touch upon in today's uh, session. So, Ashwin, why don't you uh, introduce uh, Anjana, who is the speaker for today? Okay, so um, we have uh, Anjana Badrinarayanan with us. Um, she is um, a, a faculty at um, uh, NCPS. The National Center for Biological Sciences. Uh, she did her uh, PhD uh, in David Sherratt's lab in um, uh, the University of Oxford. And uh, then she did her postdoc at MIT with Mike Locke and joined NCPS a few years uh, ago. Her uh, interest um, uh, from the science point of view is in DNA repair, which is um, an important uh, um, uh, 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 process that makes sure that uh, um, uh, the genetic material is reliably transmitted from one generation to the next. And uh, unlike um, a lot of research in this field, which is used uh, test tube biochemistry, Anjana's uh, lab uses um, uh, microscopy and cell biological um, um, approaches, which is a relatively new um, uh, field of research in, in bacteria uh, to answer um, questions on um, how um, the fidelity of um, uh, DNA is maintained uh, from one generation to the next. So, Anjana. Hey. Hi, you guys. Hi. Thanks for Hello. having me here today. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to, to share with um, everyone um, my fascination with looking at things under the microscope uh, and maybe, maybe make you guys fascinated to look under the microscope as well, perhaps by the end of this hour or so of discussion. Should we get started? Yeah, definitely. Yes. Okay, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to start by asking everyone 
to imagine a little bit. Um, if, if you can't close your eyes and imagine, then you can look at the slide and imagine. Um, look at the night sky above you. And what do you see? You see tens of thousands of stars. You see planets out there. And if you look through the telescope, you can see all the galaxies around us. The, the immenseness of the universe we are in is, is, is quite fantastical, right? Um, we feel the same level of immenseness and beauty when we look at the macroscopic world around us. You know, just recently um, I visited Bhutan and this is a picture from there. It was phenomenal. You know, the mountains you see, the, the trees, the wildlife, it always blows your mind to think that there is so much diversity in life. Um, we tend to forget that there is diversity in life that our eyes cannot see um, usually. Um, this is a microscopic image of bacteria. Um, so this, the length is in the range of 10 microns. These tiny dots you see, those are small bacteria, about one to two microns. Even the long squigglies, those are bacteria as well. Those are spirochetes. And all of these guys are growing on um, human platelets, right? So you put them under the microscope and you've got a whole universe in here that looks just like the night sky we look at above us. Um, and what I'm hoping to do today is to um, take you through some scales of, of life, right? Take you down to a scale of life that perhaps you don't normally think about um, and, and make you see the wonder of life at a scale that our eyes just cannot comprehend. So what I, what I, want, to, what I want to do, what I want you to do with me is to zoom in, right? So let's zoom in through our solar system. Let's zoom in through the earth. Um, let's zoom in through you know, the mountains we see and the waterfalls we can see, um, even all these amazing man-made structures that we see around us. We go further and we start seeing all these amazing animals. Did you guys know this Japanese spider crab? It blows my mind. It's bigger than a human. I went online and saw wow. pictures of this. It is crazy. It is so huge, right? But I mean, we're not talking about crabs today. We are going to go further. But uh, is the thing in Japan? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is in Japan. Um, I'm not entirely sure if I want to go into the waters of Japan after I know about the Japanese spider crab. Um, let us go further, though, because there is more. Um, obviously, you've got like all of these things, coffee beans and ants. And there is a big bacteria. It's bigger than a dust mite. That's great. I'm happy oh. about that. Um, okay, now we have reached a point where you can't see beyond the scale with your visible eye. And what yeah. is down here? There's a lot of stuff down here. In fact, you've reached now a scale. So if you look down here, this is 10 to the minus six, um, which is about micron scales, micrometer scales. That's where you start to see bacteria turning up. Um, of course, you can keep going deeper and you'll cross the viruses and you'll get to DNA, my favorite molecule. but. We will not talk about DNA today. We're going to zoom out a bit and talk about these guys, um, these amazing, amazing organisms that, like Ashwin said, um, perhaps allowed life to exist the way we know it now. Um, and so I'm excited to try and show you this microscopic world today. Um, so, so Anjana, like, uh, it's so amazing to see these bacteria are so tiny as compared to other organisms. So I'm curious to know how these bacteria pan out like as compared to different organisms like plants and animals uh, in, in diversity and very varieties that we see. Yeah, I mean, so um, let's see, let me go, let me show you a, a, a picture of that, right? So this is a picture of, of the di known diversity of bacteria that we see under the microscope. Of course, um, bacteria, I have to put it out here, bacteria can even be shapeless, right? So there are researchers who work on bacteria that can take any form that um, you know, the environment will, will squeeze it into. So you can also have bacteria that are not very rigid in structure, but you have all of these forms that we have documented. You've got these cocci, so all cocci are round bacteria of some sort, or they can be a little bit oval in shape. Um, an example is the bacteria that lives on our skin, Staphylococcus. Then there's these rod-shaped bacteria. They fall into these bacilli category, for example. Um, you've got bacteria that have little appendages like hands or um, feet, the way um, higher organisms have. Um, and then you have all these other shapes as well. One of our favorite organisms in the lab, Colobacter, is shaped like the crescent of a moon. Um, so they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. 
um, you've got these long filaments, you've got spirals, it, you know, you name a shape and I'm sure there's a bacteria of that shape around. Yeah. Right. So uh, given this diversity, we still see so much of so many plants and animals around us, right? And uh, I was just wondering if, if you look at all these organisms in totality, do we have, how much proportion would bacteria really be when you consider all these organisms in terms of uh, the, 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 the mass that they have on, on uh, the earth? Yeah, yeah. There I mean, are so, so many species of plants, right? So many species of animals. Yeah, so I mean, bacteria are actually super diverse. Um, in fact, we are still in process of cat cataloging and categorizing the diversity of bacteria around us. Um, there are regions of the earth that we have not completely explored as yet to know what bacteria yeah. are out there. For example, deep sea, surf deep sea um, areas. Um, Craig Venter has a ship that's going across the world trying to, cat trying to find all these bacteria that exist. Um, bacteria are actually um, quite abundant. Um, there, is, there is some, there was, there used to be a, 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 a number which said for every single human cell, there's some 10,000 bacterial cells in us. That number is not 10,000 anymore. I think it's a thousand or something. So it's much lesser, but there's still no. more bacteria than, than human cells in us. Um, in fact, there was this really nice study um, a couple of years ago where they looked at the total biomass of um, organisms on the planet, living mass on the planet as measured by carbon. Um, and they estimated that plants would be approximately 450 gigatons of carbon, which is, like you said, plants are perhaps um, quite abundant and, and yeah, definitely the most amount of biomass on the planet. Bacteria yeah. are not far behind. They're at 70 gigatons. They're in fact the second, second most abundant on, on the planet. So yeah. not far behind from your plants, right? Um, and okay, where are we in this, right? So if you, if you look <laughs> yeah. here at this little triangle, right? This triangle that's highlighted, um, that's all the animals. That's just two gigatons of carbon in the whole planet. And even out of that, humans are like sitting at 0 0.06 gigatons. So it's, we are yeah. minuscule, absolutely <laughs> minuscule. You know, in fact, we might be a planet of bacteria. Um, I remember, uh, you know, some people in, in the bacterial community, in fact, say that we are just a walking bacteria. Um, we, are, right. we are the house for the bacteria to live in. And so, you know, they're, they're pretty <laughs> abundant and pretty diverse, um, maybe more diverse than us even. Yeah, might be. So, so uh, as, yeah, it's um, uh, uh, somebody who does like uh, bacteria um, argue. Bacteria are also very intelligent because intelligent beings do not require brains. <laughs> exactly. Oh, exactly. Right. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Um, so Anjana, like uh, when when we uh, talk about that bacteria being too small for our eyes to be seen. And we know they about their diversity. So how do we actually like get to know that uh, get to know these uh, facts? Like we cannot see them. So how do we actually recognize them? Ah, well, you close your eyes and you imagine squigglies around, and that's bacteria for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, um, so you know, for for the longest time, people people looked at bacteria um, via colonies, right? So. A lot of bacteria together, say in the range of millions of bacteria together, they're going to be visible on, you know, on surfaces. Uh, you can see them on rotting surfaces, for example, along with the fungi that Sunil would have talked about. There are also bacteria. In fact, the bacteria need to get there before the fungi can. Um, so there's bacteria there before. And, and when they're in a colony, you can see all of them together as a little mass. Um, but it was... Actually, I, I want to say quite recently in the history of science, um, in the 1600s, that a button salesman decided that, um, you know, I want to pursue a hobby. So Anton von Leeuwenhoek, um, who is perhaps the pioneer of all microscopy that we know, um, he decided to, to build a microscope. This is, this is like the first microscope that um, at least we know for modern science was built. Um, so what Leeuwenhoek did was he he made a really simple contraption where he took these two convex lenses and, and put them together. And in the middle of it, he would you know, drop in uh, pond water samples, for example. And he started to, he, he'd put this microscope in his nose here and just visualize, and you can't take pictures, right? So he drew everything. And from his drawings, um, he started to see these little organisms in, in his microscopic device. 
that would you know squiggle around or were rod shaped or were you know these spiral spirochete shaped organisms and he recorded all of these um by by his drawings and he called them animalcules because they were behaving like you know these like animals they were moving around they were sometimes dividing or growing um so he knew they were living but uh, he didn't know what they were and he tried to actually tell the world about this uh, for a long time that there are these microscopic creatures but because he's a button salesman and not a scientist it was hard for people to, to you know to accept it but finally when robert hook as well um said that he sees the same things there you go um you have you have microorganisms um take the forefront and with microscopy you can see the diversity that um i'm trying to describe to you because you can look into scales that our eye just cannot see um and anecdotally anyone can build leuvenhock system so this is a this is a study from 2015 where they remade the leuvenhock microscope um and you can take pond water and and drop it into in between these lenses and dump it on your nose and you can see all these organisms the cocci and the spirals um just turn up in in pond water yeah so that's how that's how we we started to visualize um the microscopic world um around us um this, and i i want to uh, sorry go ahead so this also answers uh, hamsini's question that how did people find that there are invisible creatures uh yeah do i guess uh, his his first lewenhock's first observations were of protists i believe protists ah, no, the, the first the first observation of lewenhock was human sperm but um, ah, yes, after yeah. that yeah. <laughs> after yeah, yeah. that yes, he went yes, to the yes. protists so <laughs> and at some point he was looking at gunpowder exploding yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. i mean he he looked at everything his drawings are quite fascinating he and hook together i think they took everything under the microscope once this was working for them um Yeah, quite, quite, this, quite impressive. Kaido, uh, this person Dobell, who yeah. is probably the first microbiologist to actually translate the um, uh, Lewenhock mm. work into to English, he uh, said that Lewenhock was certainly not the first to invent a microscope. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. but he, he probably had the best by at the end of the seventeenth century. He probably had the best microscope, and he was probably the only professional microscopist. Uh, yeah a hobby microscopist yeah. apart from his tailoring unit but yeah. he was he was one of the first actually to to look at um you know samples like pond water um that that description was not made previously where he was able to describe you know these these bacterial varieties um i think yeah. he described spirochetes quite a bit which was again the first description of bacteria um in the in microscope in microscopy right yeah, yeah. so um yeah so uh, now that we have established that these are fantastic after all uh, i i i now am thinking that you mentioned that he took this from the pond water and then he studied these uh, bacteria or uh, these uh, microbes uh, how about we now talk about where it all can you find these fantastic bacteria where to find them like uh, yeah. where you know <laughs> I, I was actually hoping that we had not established that they are fantastic as yet. So I wanted to show you guys some cool images and then establish how fantastic they are. Um, I'm okay. glad you've already agreed with me, but um, you know, uh, let's start with some 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 places where we find them, just for me to sort of give you examples of their their you know truly I, I, fantastic some, nature. Is that some sort of a map over there on the topmost right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a you know I I remember this study because I was talking to um, Anitish, a student uh, uh, in the lab, and he was telling me about a recent study where they catalogued uh, microbes in the air, and that's when I remembered this study, this map study. So this was a, a study in two thousand two thousand eleven fourteen actually where they did where what they did was they catalogued all the microbes present in the New York subway, and so the map you see is actually um, hotspots of bacterial activity. um and it recapitulates pretty much the most busiest parts of the subway these are all all human associated bacteria that turn up on the maps um they took these from you know these rails that you hold on to when the trains are uh -huh. moving etc and you could essentially recreate the entire map from this um so you know they 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 truly are everywhere so the new york subway is a nice example 
to and the, the cool thing though was that apart from seeing what bacteria they that they were in the subway they were also able to categorize them into where these bacteria could be coming from right so right. you could get information on the type of foods people ate the age of the people um the ethnicity of the people because you have your own signatures for you know who you are um and so from that you could even recreate the the map of the population of new york from this subway experiment um yeah so that was that was actually a really cool well, study that's, that's amazing yeah actually. talking about subways and um, micro this is not uh, uh, to do with bacteria but there is uh, there is this uh, study many years ago where they looked at networks of nutrient channeling in smile in slime molds and ah. showed that the structure of this network was very similar to the tokyo underground yeah yeah i remember this this is super this is brilliant really brilliant yeah yeah and it's super organized right i mean it's not random yeah. they were able to see nutrients nutrients moving in a in an organized fashion if i recall correctly and there was a pattern yeah. associated with it yeah yeah so that's that's one nice example i want to give you a few more examples let's see um let let me go to the next one perhaps there's a lot there's a lot of examples i just put a few together um here what can we talk about is that a leech that is a leech that is a leech so the leech um in fact turns out cannot uh, process protein rich food on its own so it has okay. inside it um an endosymbiont that helps break down the protein rich food i forgot the name it's called an um aeromonas it's an aeromonas bacteria that mm -hmm. uh that sits in the gut of the leech and allows it to to process protein rich food i mean another example is actually this this little octopus here it's it's one of the most venomous octopuses octopi there are in um in deep water ocean um they actually carry an endosymbiont vibrio in them um and the way they eat their prey is by paralyzing the prey before eating it and right. um the endosymbiont lives in their salivary glands so the vibrio secretes toxins that paralyzes the prey and then the octopus can eat um there's no known anti venom for this by the way so i'm hoping it doesn't eat us but you never know uh yeah um there's more i actually i want i want i want to point out this this leaf cutter example because this came up in your last um in your last uh, Live stream. chat Live stream. i want yeah. i want to actually talk about it because um it's cool that these guys farm fungi but they yeah. actually have a very close relationship with bacteria for two reasons number one um the, the there's number one they they actually employ bacteria to secrete antibiotics to keep the farm fungus free um so that no other fungi will come and uh, you know invade the farm and and destroy it but there's another reason why they have these so they have klebsiella um that uh, this is a bacterial uh, group of bacteria that um help in nitrogen fixing in their farms so without klebsiella they are going to have a nitrogen poor environment so they actually are dependent on bacteria for their farms to be fully functional um so i thought i should put that in to say that so, it's yeah so klebsiella do nitrogen fixation is Up in in this case, so this was a study that came out, um, you know, a uh, couple of years ago, where they found Klebsiella doing nitrogen fixing because they they try to study the they try to recreate the ant farm um, without any bacteria, and uh. they found that the nit that nitrogen alone was a limiting factor in the farm, and so they go back into the into the vial and they try to sample what else is growing there, and they found Klebsiella. Now they don't know the mechanism by which this fixing is happening. but it is via klebsiella that this is this is going on but you're right i mean like for example in root nodules you don't see klebsiella you see um rhizobium instead rhizobium, um yeah, like cyanorhizobium yeah. meliloti um that is doing the fixing but yeah. in in the ocean you can actually have cyanobacterium that uh, does fixing like nostop oh. um that does nitrogen so, fixing so yeah. uh, maybe we can just take a uh, um uh, 30 seconds especially for the non scientists and the younger the audience here to say what nitrogen fixation is and why yes it's, yeah okay yes why not right so you know you can't most organisms cannot process free nitrogen in the atmosphere so it needs to be converted into a form that you can use for growth even plants for example they need it to be converted to a form that is available in the soil 
so they can take that and then grow and give us these very yummy peas or dal or whatever else we eat right and so this is like for example if you look at this root picture that is there next to the termites there are these little nodules you see on it those are nodules of nitrogen fixing bacteria so what they do is that they they have a, a symbiotic relationship with their host so they 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 get into a agreement with their plant and essentially say hey look i'll fix nitrogen for you and in return you give me a bunch of stuff to grow and be happy and so the the plant gives it stuff to grow and in return these nodules they take the nitrogen from the atmosphere they put it down into the ground in a manner that the root can then take it and then send it to the leaves to grow and so it's like a happy relationship you know it it works out really well for both these guys the plants and the bacteria um and 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 that's how they they do fixation um and that's an as an example of how fixation happens but symbiosis is is quite prevalent in in the environment maybe i can give one more example of 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 uh, of an interesting symbiosis yeah anjana what is uh, what is termai doing here like uh, do they also uh, take benefit yeah. of bacteria yeah 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 so actually a lot of these examples here are all symbiotic examples um both the termites and these mealy bugs actually these mealy bugs i just want to like because i just said them i want to say who they are no, so anyone who to, has uh, ha. so the one on the right is the mealy bug right yeah the, yeah yeah so right yeah down. yeah the, okay. the one okay. with these white white tentacles those are the mealy bugs on a on right. a leaf right. everyone sees them i mean if you've had a potted plant at home and you see these white things turn up on them this this absolute pest uh, these are the mealy bugs and they right. are in mean, there are plant destroyers i mean we have pots at home 50% of them have mealy bugs on them um yeah. and 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 both termites and mealy bugs they have very close symbiotic relationships with bacteria so termites have spirochetes in them these spiral looking bacteria and these spiral looking bacteria help the termites break down the cellulose in wood um so without mm-hmm. that actually termites can't eat wood even though we know termites eat wood they cannot do it without bacteria in them um and oh. and mealy bugs yeah 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 so this is a symbiotic relationship and mealy bugs are are, are bizarre okay so they have a three way symbiosis it's like a love triangle so they have so they have they have a they have a bacteria living in it um right. and this bacteria is still insufficient on its own so it has another bacteria that it has a symbiotic relationship with it with with this second bacteria so there's bacteria 1 it produces a bunch of stuff to help bacteria 2 and then bacteria 2 helps the mealy bug and then the mealy bug helps bacteria 2 and then that helps bacteria 1 it is crazy wow. right um but again these mealy bug cannot take over our our world without without the bacteria bacteria symbiotic relationship in their gut right um yeah okay but, so we have a couple of questions here sure. um that this is one from swati uh here so uh she's asking about the interaction between octopus and uh, vibrio and the question is how does the bacteria interact with the octopus and establish its function or say that it will help the octopus by paralyzing the prey so how does this uh, interaction work okay well so it's a good question it's a really interesting question how does the symbiosis get established that's a so here's the thing just think about it as a uh, as an example of 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 you know you needing life to survive so if the octopus cannot eat it's going to die um mm-hmm. and so the nutri- the only way the octopus is going to get the nutrition is by killing its prey and this bacteria um it needs nutrition as well and it realizes perhaps over over the course of evolution that one way of getting nutrition is to be able to get the octopus to get nutrition and as a byproduct of it some nutrition goes to the bacteria and there you go the bacteria is living and and um and now there is a depend interdependency so the octopus can't be without the bacteria and clearly the bacteria can't be without the octopus and so now you've got this you know this relationship this tangled web between the two um and there's a relationship that set up in fact it's it's a it's a really nice question i want to go back a bit and 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 talk about another um the leech example again so it wasn't really clear how this relationship between the leech and the bacteria gets established and only recently you know like um in 2019 they figured out that the way the leech actually even get the bacteria inside them is by eating poop of other organisms um and that's how the gut mm. gets colonized by the bacteria then then and then you establish this symbiotic relationship 
It's a beautiful right. question. I don't think this is known so, for many, many species. Yeah. So, Anjana, I was thinking with respect to this octopus example, and now that you have mentioned about the leech, uh, it could also be that it could acquire the bacteria right from the birth when the 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 birth of the new progeny is being uh, taking place, or it could acquire it through its lifetime from the surroundings or the environment, yeah, right? And yeah, that yeah, could yeah, also yeah. that could also impact how how successful that species would be or in that particular environment or if there are any. Uh, yeah. Changes in yeah, no, that, that, yeah, yeah. No, that's a really good point. I mean, like the corals are a nice example, and they're great nicely in this slide already. Um, so it right. turns out the corals don't have bacteria um, in them from the beginning. When they're juvenile, the corals are actually uh, free-floating cells, um, hmm. and so they go around in the ocean surface uh, looking for patches of bacterial, um, you know, life, which will be amenable for them to transition from juvenile to adult phase. And when right. they do that, that's when they actually form these corals that are sitting and um, that's what you see in the ocean around you. So like you're saying, sometimes it's there from birth, sometimes it comes later. Um, yeah. But in all cases, I mean, there's bacteria everywhere and they're doing super diverse things, right? I mean, they're producing these amazing pigments, they're growing these amazing shapes. Um, and they're either hijacking, hijacking their orga the host organism, or they're right. helping the host survive. Um, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a complex world. Um, so what I'm going to do actually, to tell you what I'm going to do today, we finally got to where we are going to go. Um, this is where we are. Um, so the examples I gave you, they are to tingle your curiosity into looking at a few examples in detail via microscopy, not great detail. I mean, no one wants too much detail, but some detail via microscopy. So I've set up um, five doors in a window uh, and I give you the chance to come with me through some of these doors and see what bacteria are behind them. Um, and I'll try and tell you what's cool about them. Before we do that, there's one more question. Sure. But, uh, the so, well, this is from my mom. Oh. Um, how much harm do we do to the good bacteria by frequent hand washing or presumably over, over washing? Yeah, that's a beautiful question. It's good if your hand print looks like that, auntie. Um, <laughs> you want a hand print that is looking like that. If your hand print doesn't look like that, it's not a good sign. Um, you know, <laughs> So Staphylococcus is a great example, right? So Staphylococcus is 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 known for all the wrong things. The poor thing is a, a multi-drug resistant bacteria that is creating havoc for us. I mean, it's there's no antibiotic that can get rid of it. Um, but Staph is actually not a bad dude on its own. I mean, for the most part, it we need it to be on our skin surfaces. And this is an example. So all the yellow dots you see on this handprint. Um, sorry, I. I have to go back to the handprint. All the yellow dots you see on the handprint, those are all staph. Um, and they're just normally there on our skin and they don't create any problem for us. And so I think it's important to, to not think of bacteria as you know bad always. Um, in fact, for the most part, they are absolutely important for, for our life to survive, uh, for us to survive. Um, they help us develop immunity when we are um, developing our immune response. Um, and even later, they act as the first line of defense before anything else comes and, you know, gets to us. Um, and I will hopefully, if we walk through one of these doors, give you an example of a bacteria that allowed life to even be, perhaps. Uh, so that thing at the bottom right in that uh, plate, it looks like a... Oh, uh, that's a, a photobombing that fungus. fungus. That's fungus, a photobombing right? fungus. <laughs> Why, why do you ask these questions? It's a bacterial, bacterial, <laughs> fantastic bacteria, okay? Yeah. Fungus is, is secondary in this, in this conversation. <laughs> I think Sunil is laughing me somewhere. He's watching. <laughs> hey, Sunil. Didn't say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> okay, now to the okay. magic doors. Now through the magic doors. Uh, you have okay, I should, I should you go first. I should go first. Yeah. Uh, well, since we've talked about mealy bugs, why not the one with the pots? Oh, okay. Oh. Let's go to the pots. <laughs> ah, what is that? Yes, Ashwin, it's your turn. 
Yeah, you picked the door, Ashwin. Well, so well. Uh, it, it, is that uh, whatever fungal mycelium or uh, root nodules, whatever? Uh, something. Okay, like that. I, I'm I'm glad you didn't say like you know elephant dung or something. It is it is soil, um, and there's just roots there. Uh, but it's soil. And the reason why this picture is here is to tell you about you know one of the most abundant soil bacteria out there, and that is Streptomyces. Um, so Streptomyces belongs to a, 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 a genus of bacteria that has about 500 different species, known species, but there might be more than that, who knows, but at least 500 known documented species of bacteria, and they all live in the soil. And they are very, very important for, um, for the soil, um, for, for soil function, um, as a consequence of it for also forest function or also, and also plant growth. Now, these guys were um, discovered by, um, can you see my pointer? If you can't, I will describe what I'm going to say. Uh, no, we cannot. Okay, no. so then this, this, th these guys, the streptomyces were described by this person, Selman Wakesman, um, as early as 1919, when he looked through the microscope, he's the one who's sitting next to the microscope and the young person next to him is his grad student, um, Albert Schatz. So anyway, these guys, um, Selman Wakesman particularly had a question. He said, he, when he took, every time he took soil into the lab, um, he realized that there is bacteria in the soil, but for some reason, if he puts any other bacteria from the lab into that soil mix, it doesn't survive, right? And so he was sure that there is something in there that is killing all the other bacteria. And this is what turned out to be the bedrock for us to find two thirds of the world's antibiotics. So Streptomyces, make brilliant colonies in the lab. So I'm just going to show you um, these six examples of, of streptomyces growing on different types of food sources. So if you give it, say, for example, some sore food source that looks like soil, it has this brownish colors. If you give it food sources that have potato starch in it, for example, it gives you these beautiful pink purple colors, right? And all of these colors are a, a consequence of it producing antibiotics. Um, that generally they use to kill other bacteria. They're not producing it for us. They're producing it to maybe kill other bacteria. Um, but yeah, they are very important for us as humans as well because they, they do this thing um, where they are a, a big source of antibiotics. And so when Selman Wakesman looked under the microscope, again, this is you know in 1919, for example, this plate actually is an example from 1919. There was no way to take an image. So he drew these beautiful diagrams of streptomyces. And what fascinated him was what you're seeing here. You know, they are not these single rods or cocci that are the way I showed you in these. In yeah, it looks poster. like fungi, fungi also. Yeah. No? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So in fact, they grow with these networks. They grow, they make networks just the way mycelial networks are. Um, they have these hyphae that grow and... Um, they make branches in the hyphae, and these can be very long, very, very long branches, as long as there's nutrition um, available to them. When they don't have nutrition, that's when they start to form spores. So all these yellow, all these circles that you're seeing, those are all spores that it starts to form when it has to, you know, go off and find a new nutrition store source to colonize. Um, so it has this really complex uh, life cycle. So it's not a simple, you know, a, a rod dividing and, and giving birth to more rods. Um, over time, so this is uh, from a, a friend of mine, uh, Susan Schlimper, who studies the cell, the cell cycle of streptomyces. And she was kind enough to give me this beautiful image where she has described how streptomyces grow. And there are these two main mechanisms, right? As I said, they form these beautiful network like patterns, these hyphae. And then when they go upwards, sometimes they'll form spores and then these spores can then travel around um, and, and go and colonize new places. And I want to show you a video to, to describe this process, right? So what you're going to see in this video, in this gray, in this gray, this is a streptomyces cell, okay? And the cell is going to grow over time. So you'll start to see the streptomyces make the hyphal network, um, similar to how you would see a mycelial network. And at some point during the movie, you're going to start seeing the mycelial network become spores. And so there you go, it's growing and it's growing quite um, rapidly. So you can start to see these branching patterns emerge. Those are the mycelial networks that are turning up. And at some point you start to see them all break up into spores. Um, and these spores are then going to go off and, and find new soil to grow in. 
Um, and so these are really um, stunning videos. And what Susan does is to try and understand how do cells go from you know, making these to go and make spores, for example, um, in the lab using microscopy. Um, so these are really, really stunning. And yeah, yeah, Nitish has his hand going somewhere. <laughs> So, so as you talked about these spores, like uh, and uh, div bacteria dividing and other things. So, how is it possible, like in soil? Like as I can imagine, like plants grow on soil and then they they, uh, they do pollination and then they reproduce. So, how is it possible for these bacteria to be like in soil and move around or something like that? Yeah. Ah. Okay. 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 So. Um, okay. Uh, close your eyes again and imagine <laughs> that it's a super hot day, right? It's been, it's been super, super hot uh, and all your soil on top is dry, right? And now suddenly it's late afternoon and the clouds have gathered and it's beginning to thunder a bit, right? And so you're hearing it's going to rain. You know it's going to rain. And this is like the first shower in 10 days, maybe 15 days. What is the smell that hits you when those first drops of rain touch the soil? Do you know that smell? Do you, do you just, know I, the smell of wet earth? I just it's, know it's it's called, <laughs> it's, called, it's called it's called petrichor, right? Yeah. Petrichor or petrichor. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, there, there are different words for it. In fact, I mean, it's it's culturally so important, right? I mean, we all have poetry going back, like there's old Tamil poetry that describes the smell of wet earth that hits your senses first, and it makes you so happy. I mean, it makes me very happy when I smell that. Um, and so petrichor is actually a volatile, um, volatile compound called geosmin that these bacteria produce. Um, these and um, other bacteria also, but streptomyces for the most part, they produce geosmin. Um, and they produce geosmin um, as a consequence of their sporulation process. And they do this not for us to go to the mud, they do this for these guys to go to the mud, right? And who are these guys? These guys are springtails. Um, there are these tiny insects that you can find even in your pots um, oh. that essentially have a, a springtail. So it lets them jump several, several feet, um, several inches above the ground. Um, David Attenborough says it's the same as a human doing a pole vault over the Eiffel Tower. That's the height to which they jump. Um, and they jump and then they touch the ground, right? And they touch, they go to the soil when they smell the wet earth smell. So when they smell geosmin or petrichor, they rush to the soil. And what do they do? But well, what happens when they rush to the soil? So you're seeing here uh, a zoomed in microscopic image of the springtail. So all these tiny dots are the springtail's body, all of this part. Um, the hair follicles are the springtail's hair follicles. And all of these things stuck to the springtail, that's your streptomyces spores. Um, and so they essentially piggyback on the springtail. They'll get stuck on the streptomyces, they'll get stuck on the springtail's body. And then the springtail will go jump off and you know, find a new uh, soil source for these streptomyces to be happy in. Um, and they just figured this out, you know, like literally um, two months ago in April, this beautiful study came out talking about how geosmin is produced to get the springtails to get there. So streptomyces can go off and sporulate somewhere else. Yeah. So yeah, that is so cool. Yeah, that's so cool. Okay. Cool. Okay. Couple of questions here. Okay. Um, one, I don't know anything uh, yeah, about springtails, by the way. So don't no, ask this, me about that. <laughs> 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 this in fact goes back to the previous section about corals. Ah. Oh. Okay. Um, so I'm not going all the way back. Yeah. What, what happens to the bacteria during um, coral bleaching, uh, for example, in the Great Barrier Reef and Indian Ocean? So this is a question from Arjun Singh. Oh, that's a great question. I mean, in fact, I remember um, Deepa, who's also a colleague of ours at NCBS, telling me something about a study that's been looking at this. Um, the bacteria do die. And in fact, part of the bleaching problem is the, the bacteria dying. Um, and uh, the, the symbiotic bacteria dying and that being the coral then being taken over by you know parasitic bacteria that then causes the death of the coral itself. Um, so I don't know the details of the names of the bacteria, but I do know that uh, bleaching in during the bleaching process this happens to the bacteria, um, where you lose your symbiotic bacteria and you're taken over by the ones that will eat you. Um, 
In fact, uh, I, I, I just just to sort of talk about this this a little bit more. Um, I read this really uh, fun quote on one of the one of micro one of one microbiologist's uh, Twitter account, where he says that you know, just every time you feel down and out, remember that there are thousands of cells working to make you alive, and these are all these bacteria, but they're also waiting for you to die because when when you start to go, there are all these other thousands of bacteria that are going to come and and essentially degrade you, and that's what's happening during the bleaching process. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, while talking about corals, I remember uh, this was during my PhD. There were one of these um, early microbiome sequencing studies said uh, then a coral um, a microbiome. And if I remember ah. right, pretty much everything that they had from that were fairly strict symbionts. They had fairly reduced uh, genomes. Hardly any uh, hmm. non-essential functions could be um, detected. So that means that the bleaching would probably destroy absolutely uh, yeah both. yeah and one of the topic of microbiomes yash acharya asks whether uh, we can say something about viable but non culturable bugs ah mm. okay um but what about so i mean there will be a point towards the end whenever we do get to the end of this the, where we are going to talk about um old experiments that are getting revisited to be able to study the non-culturables in, in you know, uh, manners that we've been right now studying um, single bacteria in isolation. Uh, I think it's a really important question. In fact, very recently, um, uh, Kim Lewis's group, they study antibiotics. And what they did was they went back into soil because right now all the antibiotics we know about, they're coming from these single, single culture studies of streptomyces. So what they did was they went back to the soil and they tried to find more streptomyces that we don't know about, right? And they found new antibiotics in that process. So it's a really important thing to maybe try and revisit the bacteria that we don't normally study in, in the lab. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, might, I might give you a, a, a peek, a window into maybe how this can happen um, if you want to look at it. So Anjana, uh, now that you mentioned the antibiotic, right? Uh, I was just wondering if if always bacteria need antibiotics against other uh, bacteria to really kill them, or are there other ways also? You know, uh, yeah. especially that you mentioned the two thirds of uh, the bacteria are these bacteria are the ones that produce antibiotics. But are there other ways also? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, bacteria do all sorts of things to kill other other microbes in their environment based on whether they, you know, they, they are um, competitive for them or not. Um, they poke holes in other bacteria to cause them to lice, for example, they send out toxins to, um, to kill other bacteria. Um, in fact, I, I will give you another example of a soil bacteria. Um, this is also from uh, uh, another colleague, Mathilde, who studies uh, studied uh, mixo, mixococcus for uh, a while. Um, these are some stunning images. So Mixococcus is, a, is also a really fascinating soil organism. Um, so I'm going to play this movie in a bit. But before that, what I want you to pay attention to is what these guys are going to do. So Mixo, all bacteria usually are single cell. So this is like a single cell of Mixo, all of these things you're seeing here. Um, but what they end up doing when they are together is that they behave like a, a unit. So instead of a single cell going and doing its own thing, they're going to be a group, almost like you know a herd of things going off and, and doing something or a group of friends heading out somewhere to get a coffee. And so that's what they do. So they are going to go off in groups, right? So if you watch them move in, in, in under the microscope, they have these beautiful swarming patterns where they, they swarm out in you know, groups of tens or even hundreds of bacteria. They get together, they split apart. Sometimes they coalesce together. Um, and, and why are they doing this? They're doing this because they have this really beautiful life cycle. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a life cycle that somehow, I, I'm sure the fungi people talk about it. Let me tell you, bacteria do it too. Um, so single, these are single cell organisms, right? But under the right um, conditions, they decide, uh, they make a decision. Um, I'm not saying, you know, brain-wise, they're making a, a decision based on chemical signals to come together. Right? So they will come together and they will form something called a fruiting body. So you will form a base and through the base, you will make a fruiting body. And in the fruiting body, they pack spores. 
and then the spores are released when the fruiting body opens up. This is just like how fungi do this, right? Um, the same thing that you see with fungi with the mushroom body forming and then the spores getting released, Mixo does that too. Um, and why do they do it? They do it because they are going to, they are cannibals, you know, I mean, they, uh, I, I'd like to say they're not vegetarian. Um, they eat other bacteria. Um, so this is an example of what, how they do that. So these are two dots. The small dot is a bunch of mixococcus. The big dot is a bunch of E. coli and they've been put next to each other. And this movie has been taken across seven days. And what you're going to see is all these mixo going towards the E. coli and they're going to eat all the E. coli. Um, and so this is why they swarm and then they have these complex life cycles because they um, are predators that will go in search of prey. And I mean, it's quite a stunning movie for me when I see these mixo just going off and, and essentially eating up this entire colony of, of E. coli. Yeah. So Anjana, uh, so if I understand it correct, partially that could also be the reason why they form those shapes that you showed in the last uh, slide. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, they 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 swarm to find the E. coli. I think they form the 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 spore, the fruiting body, um, for releasing the spores to new environments. So I'm guessing that is more for uh, during nutrient deprivation rather than right. for going go, during the eating process. I think the swarming is when they do the predation, and then the fruiting body is when they um, they're done with this nu the nutrition patch they have, which is why you actually see the fruiting bodies now. At, that's a See, they finished eating the E. coli, and that's when you start seeing all these blobs that are forming. These are all fruiting bodies, um, right. which will most likely pack spores to go away somewhere. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's that's my examples of like two. That's my door for. Um, there's no mealy bug in the door, Ashwin. I'm sorry. Um, it was Streptomyces <laughs> and Mixo instead. <laughs> <laughs> so should I choose one, Mohak? Yeah, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Okay, uh, I would like to choose this uh, old-looking uh, door, uh, like They're all second, uh, second, <laughs> <laughs> second row, second column, like two by this two. one. Yeah, this one, this one. Okay, yeah. <gasps> we're too late. This is slime <laughs> mold that is growing after the bacteria are come and gone. You should have picked that door earlier, I would say. They are so beautiful, but they are oh. not here. Um, they are slime mold. <laughs> that are making fruiting bodies um, and popping. Quite stunning. But for another time, I will be early. Yeah, next time I will be early. Yeah, for another time. For another time. Okay, Mohak, how about you going ahead then? Um, I'll choose the blue one, the blue door. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Mohak. You sent us out of space, um, out <laughs> into space. <laughs> Why are we here, you guys? Um, any guesses? Are there bacteria in space? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you have to tell me. I mean, uh, I, I won't blow the whistle, but yeah. We are here because um, there's bacteria in the ocean. Um, and wow. they are perhaps the most abundant bacteria on the planet and these are cyanobacteria. So what you're seeing here are algal blooms of blue-green algae, which are also known as cyanobacteria growing in the ocean. And they go through this periodic bloom and burst cycle. And um, I wanna give you an example of, of cyanobacteria and why they are also um, supremely, supremely fascinating organisms. Um, so cyanobacteria, in fact, is a much newer entrant into the field of bacterial cell biology. Um, uh, for example, this bacteria Plochrotococcus, it, is, it does 5% of all the photosynthesis on the planet, right? Um, and it has, so the example here is given of Volkswagen beetles, but it's essentially like this car, um, let's say the same size as a, as a Maruti Beleno, I think. Um, it's, it's all of those Maruti Balenos packed together, and that's what is the biomass of Plochlorococcus on the planet. I'm terrible at names. So anyway, these guys, Sally Chisholm, Susan Holsky, and Rob Olson, they um, are biogeographers as well as microbiologists, and they went off on an expedition to try and find 
you know, these organisms in the environment. And only in, 19, in the 1980s did we realize that most of the photosynthesis is occurring from bacteria because these bacteria carry um, the ability to, 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 to fix um, or to take carbon dioxide from um, the atmosphere and do the same cycle that plants do to give us oxygen. Um, and so those blooms that you saw from the, you know, from space, if you put them under the microscope, that's what they're going to look like. These are um, cyanobacteria that are growing under the microscope. They grow in these long rod-shaped structures um, in these big masses. In fact, you can even see them if you um, have like a, a 200 to 300x um, magnification. You should be able to see these if you go and collect um, pond water um, and then zoom into them. Uh, they are very, very stunning organisms. And the green obviously comes from, um, you know, the ability for them to um, use something like chlorophyll for photosynthesis. Um, they actually, yeah, I want to tell you one more thing about them. They are, the reason why they're growing like these rods is because like, unlike most other organisms, like, you know, I showed you um, mixococcus that can swarm around. They have these flagella that can move them around in, in um, the environment. But cyanobacteria, they don't have the machinery to, to swim in, in free water. So instead, what ends up happening is that they grow as these singular rods or sometimes like these guys, they will form corkscrews and then they just slowly tumble in, in the environment they are in. So, Anjana, um, so they can't, huh? Uh, when they grow, uh, they still are single cell. Ah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, they're not single cell, in fact, they are many cells together. Uh, ah. yeah, 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 that's a really good question. You know, in fact, it's, a, it's really hard to study their cell biology in the lab. So um, it takes six to 12 hours to get one cell division out of them. So right. you, you have to make, do some tricks to, to get them to grow faster. And when you do that, they become single cell in the lab. But out in the oh. environment, they're actually making these multicellular structures that tend to break. You know, like if you right. see the previous video, um, the division seems to be some sort of breakage in, the, in this long filament. Um, and, you know, not much is known about this, about this system really mm -hmm. in, the, in the environment because it's really hard to do, do these very long, you know, movies of, of bacteria growing in the lab. Um, yeah, but yeah, you're right. That's a, that's a really important point. They are actually multicellular in some ways um, because they're growing together as this, this, this group, of, group of cells. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so-, so, so Anjana, uh, back to the previous slide, like uh, these look like algae to me. Like earlier I thought that these are just algae in the ocean, but like, Currently, this is so eye-opening for me that these are really bacteria. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in fact, when they first were found, they were called blue-green algae. Um, oh, yeah. Because, because it was, I, I think it was inconceivable to think they could be bacteria. <laughs> um, but they are bacteria. They are bacteria that, um, I actually want to go back to Ashwin's point, right? So um, Ashwin said that there, there are bacteria, there is, most likely bacteria that gave us the ability to have mm. life on the planet. And it's most likely these guys that did that. Um, so for example, um, scientists have found fossil records for cyanobacteria. Um, so what you're seeing here in this picture, the bottom picture, this brown, this brown picture on the ocean are stromalites from Western Australia. Now, these are fossils of cyanobacteria that are 3.5 billion years old, billion, not million, right? Um, the age of the earth itself is something like 3.8 billion years. Oh. So these guys have been around for a long time. And, you know, in some of the really well-preserved fossils, you can see these colonies of cyanobacteria that are really nicely well-preserved um, inside. Uh, and so they've been fixing carbon um, for billions of years, I want to say. Uh, and only recently are we, tr are we really understanding how carbon fixation happens. So if you take, I told you, you have a trick to make these cells uh, grow faster in the lab. And so if you take them in the lab and you grow them in the presence of oxygen, they're super slow growing. They, they do not enjoy it. But if you give them carbon dioxide, which they seem to like, um, they start to grow really happily. And they do this by, by fixing the carbon dioxide inside the cell. So all these blue dots that you see turning up really rapidly, those are mm -hmm. all these structures into which the carbon dioxide goes in. And then you can do photosynthesis using it. 
Um, and so these are so rare because I mean, I don't know of any other bacteria that will you know, be so happy given carbon dioxide and grow in, in this manner via carbon fixation. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So this, this is like fixation done by plants, you can say, no? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. They, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, the only thing, only difference is that um, they don't, uh, they don't do the second cycle that plants do, uh, uh -huh. right. but they, they do the first, the first photosynthetic cycle. In fact, um, as another aside, because these are so cool, um, they also have a circadian rhythm. So I don't know if you, if you guys, uh, I mean, you guys, but I mean, generally circadian rhythms are these, these rhythms that help us have you know, sleep wake cycles, for example, you wake up in the morning, you go to sleep at night, or, you know, you feel hungry at a particular time of day. So these are all, 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 you know, organisms like ants have some circadian rhythms also. Plants have a, a rhythm, a day night cycle. These bacteria also have a day night cycle. They, they grow during the day and they you know, sleep during the night in some ways. Uh, so, and, and so much is not known about them right now. People are still studying them. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, like, the, like they are present in like deep down in the oceans also, right? So uh, like how does like uh, their circadian rhythm being dictated, dictated by the light? Like are there any other mechanisms maybe or we don't know uh, about them? That's a really cool question. I don't know. You know, the yeah. only mechanism I know is of a, a light sensing mechanism. Light. I, I don't yeah. know. That's a good question. Yeah. You know, with uh, I think was it I think it's probably pro chlorococcus the same this is the thing that's <laughs> difficult to pronounce the same thing. I think there are if if I remember right it's the same it's that species there are multiple strains I believe or different species of the same genus I'm not sure um, but there are those which are very well adapted to different um, depths in the ocean. And which may mm. have something to do with um, uh, the uh, accessibility to light and their ability to respond to um, uh, light. So there is uh, some diversification going on at that uh, level. So, so you, uh, you think they might have like different uh, different uh, sensitivities of light sensors that I, work at? I, I guess so. I guess so. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, that's very interesting. That's yeah, cool. that is super so, interesting. Now that we've uh, talked a bit about oceans and we've also talked about soil, so here we have a question from Surbi. Uh, mm -hmm. Do we know uh, whether it is land or ocean which has more bacterial species? Ah, oh, that's such a good question. Um, yeah, so that's such a great question. I mean, you know, I don't know because I don't think we've explored enough of the ocean to, to know what the diversity is in the ocean. Um, and to be honest, uh, I don't even know whether we've explored enough of the land to know how much diversity there is. I mean, we are still finding new species. Um, so, but I, I, I think we will only know when we, we have really explored enough of the ocean to know. Um, especially, you know, the deep, the deep sea uh, ocean, the deep oceans, for example, symbi the symbiosis between bioluminescence, the ability of these organisms to, to light up, uh, comes from bacteria. And there is evidence that this ability, the symbiotic relationship has evolved independently 27 different times in oceans. So my guess is that there is a lot of diversity in the oceans that we really just don't know about as yet. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a very interesting question. No, I think um, it was uh, Sandeep uh, Krishna from NCBS. So he who told me about uh, his conversation with somebody who is working on a deep ocean bacterial species. Yeah. And okay. apparently this thing um, has a doubling time of a thousand years or something like that. It's <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> that's the <laughs> estimated. <laughs> I think I probably made an estimate based on its, uh, I don't know, I guess based on its uh, metabolic rate. It's so slow that they think yeah, it's... Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, it's true. But, you know, things in, in the deep ocean are generally quite slow. There, there was this um, podcast I heard the other day about uh, an octopus in, in uh, deep ocean that um, essentially it goes through a, a starvation-based death cycle. And it uh -huh. took some, I think, some several months to die. It starved itself for not four or five days, but you know something in the range of 24, 25 months before finally it withered away. So everything is slow there, right? So you know maybe bacteria are dividing every thousand years. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. 
Anyway, I'm going to take you guys back to the doors um, and ask okay, you to pick I, another I, one. I will take another turn, okay? Go for it. Uh, uh, I will go for this second row, first door. Uh, oh no! You have a photo <laughs> bomber here, Natish. The tardigrade. It was supposed to be all about E. coli, but the tardigrade has turned up and. Um, unfortunately, the bacteria are not to be seen. Um, too bad. Oh. You picked a you picked a bad door again. I'm sorry <laughs> for you. I'm sorry for you. Um, you know, better luck next time. I would say. Okay, Ashwin. How about you too, Richard? Like, it's my bad luck today. <laughs> well, uh, well, I think you 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 should get another chance. Oh, okay. that was so sweet of you. <laughs> Okay, I'll go for this top right. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. right. Okay. Uh, what Ooh. is that? Is it? Um, it looks like a unicorn or something like a it conical. Is, I don't know. It is. It is not. It is. Yeah. Some. I've shown this to to friends of mine, and they call it unicorn poop. It is not <laughs> that. Um, it is what. I don't know of anyone who doesn't like this. Um, I don't know of anyone who doesn't like this. This okay. is chocolate. Ooh. This is cacao beans, right? Um, uh. Of course, we don't eat it like this. We eat it after a lot of processing. And that processing comes by a fermentation. So, you know, you go through all of these stages. So this top pod here, that is your cacao plant. You pull out the seeds from it, and then you break the seeds down via fermentation. And I'm sure Sunil will talk to you guys about fermentation. Um, and so I won't go into details of fermentation, but I'm going to tell you something about fermentation that is quite interesting. Um, and then finally, even then, after you get the cacao ready, it is. Have you guys tasted 100% dark chocolate? It is so difficult to eat. So difficult to eat. I mean. You know, that's why they put all the sugar and the butter and all that, I guess, to finally make it palatable for, you know, for us normal people to eat. Um, of course, you know, the Mayans figured out fermentation a while ago, uh, a long time ago. Uh, they used chocolate as currency. So they really knew that the cacao bean, this, this, you know, this white bean that I showed you has to be broken down uh, before it can be eaten. Um, and only recently have people been uh, really understanding the process by which cacao goes through fermentation and then becomes this edible, you know, uh, seed that we can eat um, and, and really, really enjoy. I love chocolate. Um, and so what exactly is going on during this fermentation process? So this is a, a, a microscopy image, a, a electron microscopy image of the cacao seed before it's broken down. So this white bit here, you see the IS, that's the inside of the seed that is super hard. Um, and if the seed is like this, you cannot use it for, for you know, food. Um, but over time, when you start to ferment it, um, apart from fungi, there are bacteria that also turn up during the fermentation process. In fact, they turn up quite early during the fermentation process. And so these are images um, through the process of fermentation um, showing you um, bacteria inside this, this white little part of the seed that has finally grown and, and made it soft enough for us to then make into powder and eat. And these bacteria are, are bacilli. These are rod-shaped bacteria that really are so important for, for the process of, of, of breaking down cacao. And so this is like a, a graph just to sort of show you that there are lots of organisms that turn up um, during the cacao making process. You know, you start with uh, yeast, obviously, yeast are really important. So, so don't, uh, don't feel bad. Um, yeast are super important. But apart from yeast, you also have these acidic bacteria, lactic acid bacteria and acetic acid bacteria. And these are bacteria that you will also see in, in curd, you know, in curd or idli. How many of you guys eat idli? Uh, anyway, I, I eat idli. I love idli. Um, there were, and there so were many, <laughs> many questions. There were many questions on idli in, idli in last session. Isn't that like the best food ever? Anyway, that's an aside. Um, and there is also a paper on the idli. Yeah. yeah isn't, I, I saw that. Isn't that so cool? Yeah. That is a brilliant paper. Um, and, and they, they describe the lactic acid bacteria in, in Italy also. That is very cool. Um, yeah, so anyway, so there are, there are these yeast and the fungi that come and they set the pH right for the fermentation. So early on, you want acidic pH. And so you get that from these guys. But there are these one set of bacteria. There are 
almost nearly constant and there all the time and these are these so anjana anjana uh, so uh, are these these different set of bacteria and is they are they are introduced or they are present in that region already uh, where uh, so they, they 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 are present in the environment so the way the fermentation oh. happens that um it it sort of it's it's what is there around i mean i don't know during this whole lockdown process a lot of us got into making sardo um mm. this bread with uh, you know taking whatever we have around us um we did that too and it's a phenomenal process um you guys should try it if you haven't it's quite fun um and so it just comes from whatever is there around you and that's 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 how this entire thing gets triggered in in some cultures there is evidence for you know spitting for example into the fermentation process they do this for some alcohols um but from what i know uh, in this case it's just whatever is there um that triggers this entire process um yeah and so you know finally at at you know four or five days after fermentation um these cacao seeds are finally ready they're ready to be used by us um and if you see there's this blue i mean i want to say blue i don't know what color you guys see um but uh, you know the steelish blue color endospore forming rods that are just always there um and when you put your cacao seed into a furnace and you burn oh. it at 120 degrees those guys uh-huh. are still going to be there most likely when you're eating chocolate you're eating some endospore forming bacteria um right oh so are those the, are those harmful for us no they I mean they're not harmful i mean they 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 are they're fine i mean we've been eating cacao for a while now so it's, it's okay um but they are quite resilient um they 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 form these spores which are um very hardy cells um they look like this right so what you're seeing here is not a picture of the cacao bean it's actually pictures of spores um from within the cacao bean um and what's what's really fascinating about them is that they can resist high temperatures um desiccation cold temperatures you know you name the the extremity and it's likely that spores can spores can survive it and so you know spores bacilli or this ability for bacteria to form spores or bee rods that was also first seen microscopically um i i i you guys heard of robert koch um you know the the famous yeah. uh, guy who came up with the koch postulates i remember learning this in like microbiology class yeah. in, in college or something microbiology I remember, 101 i don't remember the koch <laughs> postulates unfortunately so <laughs> don't ask me about that um but you know apart from koch's postulates what he did was he looked under the microscope and he drew these pretty pictures of bacillus anthrax um which are which have also really interesting life cycles they can form these long uh, vegetatively growing cells or they can form spores um and so over time uh in the lab cell biologists find this quite a fascinating process and so we we as an um cell biologists have studied bacillus spore formation for um several several decades now and we've come up with this really beautiful picture of how these organisms grow and so this is a actually a really nice cartoon by um a cartoonic representation of the cell cycle by kanika khanna um she has actually a really beautiful study with uh, cryo tomography looking at the spore formation process some stunning videos um so anyway so what you see here is a is a bacteria that can also make life choices you know everybody seems to be making life choices here um so these guys make life choices too uh they have a choice of either growing vegetatively which means that one cell gives you two cells and both of them can grow and be alive um but they also have a choice of making a spore and when they do that they make a sacrifice so the spore is made within the cell that starts the formation process so that's called mc the mother and the fs is the daughter or the or the child okay so the mother and the child so the mother is going to essentially make the child right and do during that process um at some point the mother is going to break apart and the spore is going to get released so i'm going to show you a video of this happening um in under the microscope so what you're seeing here um is this little picture here so there's the the mother and then there is this this child that is going to be the spore and so when you start to grow at some point you're going to start seeing everything pop and what you're left with are these spores um and these spores can then survive you know whatever you want you can revive them 100 years later or 1000 years later and they'll still be there um going strong 
Uh, and so bacteria use it as a way of dealing with stressful environments. You know, they'll decide to, to scorrelate if it's too, too stressful, nutrition is low or it's too hot, for example. Um, you know, you'll see this process happening in, in several bacterial systems. Um, in fact, you know, it's now 20 years ago, but still uh, they revived a, a bacillus spore 250 million years after it was fossilized. And this actually grew in the lab. It's growing somewhere in the lab, in a lab somewhere. So it's not just that they found the spore, they also managed to grow it back in the lab again. Um, so how did they come to know about that? Like it was 250 million years ago, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I was actually a bit baffled about it as well. I went to the paper and tried to look at it. You can uh -huh. see, they, they, there's two images in the paper. There's one image of a salt crystal and there's an arrow saying that's where the spore is. Um, I still don't know how they figured out that's the spore, but somehow they figured out that's the spore and um, they called it its own thing. It's called Bacillus marismatis or something like that um, because it's, it's a species that humans didn't know about until 2000. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know how they figured out that there is a Bacillus there. Um, in fact, I'm sure there are places even in India that um, are yet to be explored where we might be having spores, you know, that um, we've not we've not found as yet. This was found in New Mexico um, in these soldanas, these very um, ancient uh, ruins that are quite preserved. So maybe there's something like that here as well. So, Anjana, so what seems from all these discussions about spores and all the three examples that you gave is that whenever there are unfavorable conditions, then bacteria uses this as a strategy, right? To, uh, to overcome uh, those yeah. conditions till the time favorable conditions come back. Or, or are there other conditions also where form, spores can form? Yeah, I mean, so uh, this is also a really new field, yeah? So um, hmm. in fact, only, only last year, um, I heard about uh, this, this idea that, um, you know, originally always it's been thought that spore farming is a, is a property of stress, but it could also be that it's a property of the type of cell you are. So, you know, it's, it's, so the, the, the bacteria have, have either a monolayer or a double layer um, a cell wall. And so right. it turns out that uh, sometimes to divide a double layer, you need to make a spore because that makes the division process easier. And so it could be that correlation came as a consequence of division in those type of bacteria, um, right. and then was adopted by these systems who need to survive, you know, extreme climates. I don't know. I don't know the answer, but yeah, it is possible that maybe it uh, it is not just for stress. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so I just want to like give you this picture again and tell you that when you bite into chocolate next time, uh, remember there's. Uh, there's may, most likely some spore coming with it in your mouth. Um, there's bacteria there too. Okay, I'm gonna take you back here. And there is only one option. Ashwin, uh, can choose yeah. what you like. <laughs> <laughs> no, so uh, Anjana, we have talked about these examples now. Um, why, why don't you also tell us about how now clearly the the, the importance of visualization in research and understanding these bacteria right has come up during the whole live stream today. So in lab, if one were to study, could you could you comment on that something something? Yeah, I can great. give you yeah. a I can give you a window, but Ashwin needs to choose it. So <laughs> choose the window, Ashwin. Yeah, the window then. Okay, excellent. Let's go to the window and let's go to 1880. Um, you know, for when, when, when people started to take bacteria and make single cultures out of it, there was a Russian scientist, Sergei Vinogradsky, who said, I want to study bacteria in their more natural environments, right? And so he had this, this sort of dream of, of seeing bacteria as how they would be if you were to see them in, in natural settings. So this is, for example, uh, an image of a pond. And the green color is coming from cyanobacteria, the yellow, the brown orange color is coming from iron oxidizing bacteria. Um, similarly, here you're seeing a picture of another pond where you're seeing these purpley gray colors and those are coming from um, sulfur reducing bacteria, or even, um, you know, uh, even the black colors can come from these organisms. So what Sergei Vinogradsky wanted to do was to try and, and, and recreate these settings in the lab, right? Because 
to get this you can't take a single culture of of cell single culture of bacteria you have to make the complex ecosystem um you know recreated and this comes back to i, I don't remember arjun's question perhaps where he or someone's question where they asked about how do you study non culturables and maybe this tool going back in time to this tool might be a great way of going back and studying these bacteria that is so hard to grow in the lab otherwise and you can do this for yourself if you want you can make something called the winogradsky column it's really straightforward to do all you need is um a bottle of some sort or a or sort of cylinder i mean whatever you like right i mean just take some some plastic or glass um go find a place that you find interesting in your environment you know um under a tree or next to a pond and dig out the soil right and pack the soil up into a column and so what you have then is is this winogradsky column and so what ends up happening in the winogradsky column if you're patient so you need to be patient few months you're going to start having these layers segregate the top layer which will always be water is going to have your green cyanobacteria and it's going to have this beautiful green color um and as the layers segregate you're going to start to see reds and purples coming from um you know a certain group of bacteria and then you're going to have a uh, bacteria that eat sulfur and so you're going to or be able to uh, metabolize sulfur and so you're going to have these purple bands um then you can have iron oxidizers and that will give you um orange to brown bands and then the blacks usually come from sulfate resi reducing bacteria and so you'll see those bands as well right and so from doing this you can create all sorts of magic right because you can go across you know all of bangalore go all go to all the lakes and make your winogradsky column and see what type of bacteria are growing in you know each of these environments and based on the type of bacteria you have you're going to get all sorts of colors right you're going to have the blacks more or if you have more browns then maybe you had more iron oxidizers or if you had more greens maybe it's all about cyanobacteria there and so when vinogradsky used to do this he was doing it at this level um at at looking at the colors and knowing what bacteria they are um you can then um try to classify what bacteria they are since i like microscopy you can take those and you can visualize them under the microscope and you can see what diversity there is this is actually a movie from the vinogradsky column itself of bacteria from the top layer so you've got your cyanobacterial rods and you've got these tiny bacilli that are floating around as well um and so that's one way in which you can visualize for your own self um the world around you um microbiology my microbiologic biologically uh bio how do you say that word oh my god i've forgotten how to say that word micro microbiologically <laughs> thank you microbiologically um and microscopically i mean i hope that what's happened in our journey today is this is the end of our journey unfortunately um is that i have maybe made you feel excited about thinking about all of these beautiful organisms as a bunch of walking bacteria um and not just that i hope i have also told you um or excited you that maybe there is merit in putting them under the microscope um and seeing this amazing life that is living inside these guys right and that's the life that that makes us who we are and that's it no more doors <laughs> no more doors <laughs> <laughs> cool uh, so then i think uh, this this was an extensive discussion about how bacteria where to find them and we discussed extensively about even visualizing bacteria um how about we then for the next live stream again anjana uh, if you're on board with us uh, we could uh, talk about how we can study these bacteria now in the lab um that would be a great a uh, great uh, second part to having you with us on this live stream session sure, as long so, as you know i can like um talk about the amazingness of microscopy yeah, i want <laughs> <laughs> how about you think if we take suggestions from the people uh, the who are listening yeah, to us yeah that would we, be nice that would be nice right so so all the listeners out there if you have any topic which you think you would like anjana to cover uh, if just to know how can that be studied that bacteria can be studied in lab that would be a great input uh, so you can put your uh, feedback in the feedback form and then we will take it up uh, for the next time 
and there are Thank also you. one or two questions that are a bit outside the uh, focus area for today maybe we can uh, um yeah. look at some of those for example uh, bacterial reproduction and so on so oh yeah 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 oh absolutely that, uh, the next next that would be super fun in fact you know bacterial reproduction is uh, is actually a really cool topic for uh, you, we can talk about asymmetry we can talk about um, complex divisions as opposed to you know just breaking into two um, there's a lot there's there's yeah there's there will be quite fun that's nice it's a nice idea oh great uh, great so i think we got a title for our next session fantastic bacteria and how to study them <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank thanks a lot, Anjana, for coming to uh, our outreach initiative and doing giving this amazing talk. And you must have uh, triggered the young minds like and made them curious. And uh, it's a pleasure to host you and like see you in the next talk also. So and also thank you all uh, uh, viewers, listeners, uh, to stay connected with us uh, till this like ninety minutes it has been and. and please 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 go uh, go to the feedback forms and the google form to register which is provided in the description below uh, description of the video below and if you if you enjoy this thing and enjoy and uh, want to be part of uh, our outreach initiative like share and subscribe as all all people say and follow our social media channels and thank you so we are sorry like if we could not take uh, questions in your live session so uh yeah we are we are sorry that we could not take any questions so anitish uh, how about the questions that are left if there are any so people whose questions could not be addressed they can also write the us back right those questions that we can yeah sure back. sure write back to us uh, in the feedback form or directly write back to us on any of the social media handles or email us directly so that's all and thank you